Tonight we will discuss the philosophy of Nietzscheism and its relationship to the philosophy of objectivism. For this tonight, tonight are Alan Gotthelf, a graduate student of philosophy at Columbia University, and Jerry Goodman, a student at Columbia University School of Engineering. Ms. Rand, is there any basic difference between the philosophy of Nietzscheism and the philosophy of objectivism? I would say practically a total basic difference. I'm very anxious to d separate objectivism from Nietzsche altogether. Uh, the reason for the mistaken uh, rapprochement that some people uh, hold between my philosophy and that of Nietzsche is that Nietzsche has certain very attractive, very wise quotations that purport to, to uphold individualism uh, with which one could agree out of context. But accepting uh, his general feel or uh, feeling for individualism, I would not consider Nietzsche an individualist. And above all, he's certainly not an upholder of reason. When you judge a, pr a philosophy, you must always start by judging its fundamentals. And in all fundamentals, particularly metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, objectivism not only differs from Nietzsche, but is its opposite, his opposite. Therefore, I do not want to be confused with Nietzsche in any respect. Mr. Gotthelf. Well, let's get into Nietzsche's philosophy and see precisely what it is he is saying and why objectivism disagrees. Now, Nietzsche, we know, was a German philosopher who lived between 1844 and 1900 and was in the German Romantic tradition. Now, what Nietzsche himself advocated as a disciple of Schopenhauer and uh, adding his own features were, we know, of course, that reality, in essence, is a will, the will to power. Now, he never made very clear what that means, except that it's manifested in all natural things. And therefore, um, every action in the world is to be seen as the action of that entity willing for power. Now, he then went on to say that man's reason is not what gets at reality, but man's will, therefore. He further went on to say that as to what the content of this will is, well, it is determined for each man. In ethics, he said that the only, that there really is no rational standard of value. But if there is to be a standard at all, then the good would be the realization of this will to power. And that those men who were born with a certain kind of will, what he, the men he called the superman, would then will, uh, in effect, would will anything, whatever came to their mind, it seems, and they would go about their life, and the good would be the willing for power, and in the process, what, they, what the effects of this on other people would be had no bearing on the act being good or not. Now, could you briefly run through objectivism's view on metaphysics, on human nature, on epistemology, and on ethics? Just, of course, uh, we can't go into it in detail, certainly in a half an hour program, but statements which would state clearly where objectivism disagrees on each of these four issues. Well, I would say on all of these four issues. Uh, to begin with, uh, the idea that reality consists of a will contradicts everything about objectivist epistemology and the objectivist method. That is, you do not start with wide, undefined, floating abstractions devoid of any rationally defensible or demonstrable meaning. Uh, this, a, the idea of a will representing reality is just as bad and of the same order as the idea of any philosophical idealist who claims that uh, reality consists of an idea, not somebody's idea, but just an idea. And uh, Schopenhauer's Nietzsche will belongs in the same category. This is why I regard Nietzsche philosophically as a mystic, because reality to him is not real. He does not recognize the objectivity of reality. He is a subjectivist to that extent, to begin with, as you correctly presented. If uh, the ultimate reality is a will, then it means the subjective will, or in fact the whim, of any particular individual. Uh, that's metaphysically. Epistemologically, 
Nietzsche did believe that a reason is not valid. He has contradicted himself many times on this subject. In some uh, respects, he allowed certain lesser role to reason, as most Platonists do. But in this respect, his most revealing book is the one called The Birth of Tragedy, in which he introduces two principles, uh, the principle of Apollo and of Dionysius, as he calls it. The principle of Apollo is reason, which he regards as all oh, contributing certain values and of some importance, but really secondary uh, and subsidiary uh, as all mystics regard reason. But Dionysius is the uh, symbol or principle of some kind of innate uh, non-rational power, which may be whim, emotion, will, or anything you wish to call it, but which is apart from and superior to reason. And he specifically uh, stated that the Superman would be the man who uh, lives by or functions under the Dionysius principle, not the Apollo principle. Now that is the exact opposite of objectivism, which holds that reason is man's only tool of knowledge, his only tool of values, and that reason is the only uh, faculty of man which should guide him in his actions and in his perception of reality. That is his only tool, there is no other. Uh, this is in regard to Nietzsche's epistemology. Now, the way he saw men, as you stated correctly, he believes that men are born with certain innate ideas, characteristics, or dispositions, and that some are born to be supermen and others are born to be slaves. Now, he meant, uh, again, the issue of slaves, he never made it very clear whether he meant it literally and politically or metaphysically in the sense of an inferior class of beings. And here he is guilty of many contradictions. On the one hand, he was opposed to political dictatorship or the political state. On the other hand, he claimed that the so-called slave or inferior men are the natural prey for the superman. And that this issue as to who belongs where is totally non-objective and deterministic. You are born one way or the other and uh, you're just then, in effect, an automaton uh, working out his predestined path. Now, that's the exact opposite of objectivism, which holds that man is born tabula rasa, that he does not inherit any ideas or any values at birth, that he has to develop his own character, his own values, and his own ideas and knowledge. He has to acquire it by a volitional action of his own mind. That man's mind, which is a volitional faculty, is the tool which uh, as, uh, establishes not only man's survival and his action against uh, inanimate matter, but also determines and creates his own soul. That is, his, uh, by soul I mean consciousness, his own values. He is not born a superman or an inferior man. He is born a tabula rasa, and he thereafter creates his own character. He is a being of self-made soul, as we would call it. Now, what was uh, the last point you made, or are, does this cover your question? On ethics, Nietzsche's principle that the man... Oh, yes. Now, uh, yes, I remember, thank you. Uh, in, uh, on ethics, Nietzsche believed that uh, your own whim Mind you, not your rational self-interest, but your own desire is the sole standard of the good. And that the good is thoroughly subjective. It's whichever your will happens to choose, whichever it is. Uh, whereas objectivism holds, of course, that morality is the province of reason. That an objective, rational code of morality can and must be established, and that man cannot live successfully by the guidance of anything other than a code of rationally established and demonstrated objective moral values applicable to all men. Mr. Goodman. In your books, your heroes are such as John Galt, Hank Reardon, and Howard Rourke. These are all superior people. This has led to the confusion of your philosophy with that of the Nietzschean concept of the uberman. Would you comment upon the differences? Well, yes, certainly, because here it's an equivocation on the word superior. 
if you mean superior in the sense of excellence, and superior is a bad word to use here, if you mean that some men excel, are better than other men by a, a means of a self-developed, self-made virtue, that is a different thing entirely than Nietzsche's concept, which divided men in effect into two species. You see, uh, the word superior is more applicable to uh, Nietzsche's philosophy. It is a word which we never use. And I never describe my heroes as superior men. I describe them as ideal men, which is a different concept entirely. Now, in Nietzsche's concept, a man is superior or inferior by birth. It has nothing to do with morality. He is born one way or the other. Now, if men are determined to be something by birth, uh, this places the whole issue outside the province of morality. You can neither take credit nor blame for an issue in which you have no choice. Morality pertains only to those aspects of existence in which man has a choice. Now, objectivism holds that man is a being of self-made soul, meaning that he has the choice to create his own virtue or vice, not superiority and inferiority, but excellence, efficacy or incompetence, weakness, evasion, all of which are within m the province of man's choice and are determined by him, not by any kind of uh, innate determinism. So that the difference there is enormous, but it is only uh, a superficial kind of mentality which would say, since you admit that there is such a thing as some men who are better in some respects than others, you are therefore uh, in the same category philosophically as Nietzsche, who believes that men are divided into two different species. You can see that uh, Nietzsche and objectivists in this respect stand at opposite poles philosophically and do not agree, do not belong in the same category. Ms. Ryan, it's often said that if a man is truly superior, why should he follow the same moral codes as the inferior people have to follow? Because, again, uh, you do not define clearly here the terms superior and inferior. A moral code has to be based on man's nature. Uh, men do belong to the same species. They are the same kind of living being, and therefore any moral code uh, to be objective has to be applicable to that which constitutes the essence of the nature of the entity for whom that code is intended. A code which contradicts man's nature uh, is impossible for him to practice, and certainly altruism is an arch example of that kind of code. Uh, rationally, a code of morality has to be based on the nature of the being for whose guidance it is intended. Since men are uh, all examples of the same species, their fundamental rules of conduct, that which is common to all of them, and applies to all of them, will have to be the same. Uh, if some men are better than others in certain talents or in certain achievements, this is merely a matter of degree. It is a difference of degree, not of kind. Therefore, you couldn't have different rules for so-called superior men or inferior men. To begin with, those terms have to be defined, and if they are uh, defined in terms of innate ability or acquired moral character. In both cases, the basic rules will have to be the same for all men, since they are based on the fundamentals of man's nature, not on degrees uh, uh, of their achievement or of their virtue. Uh, no morality will, uh, no proper morality, uh, will consist of concrete, narrow, specific rules. Every morality consists of wide, basic principles. Therefore, the use, the application of those principles, which a better man or a le lesser man will make, will differ according to the nature of their own moral status or their own ability. That's the application. The degree will differ, not the basic principle, which will, in logic, have to be the same for all. Mr. Gotthelf. Mr. Rand, would you agree that there is, in fact, an inherent contradiction in the last question? If the question uh, meant superior in terms of moral excellence, then a man is superior only 
to the extent to which he follows a certain moral code. So then to ask... Of course, uh, that's a very good observation. Uh, there is a contradiction in, in the question. Mr. Goodman. Ms. Rand, what is the basic reason for action in the objectivist philosophy as compared to the powerless drive of Nietzsche? Uh, would you say that again, please excuse what me? Is the I basic, what is the basic reason for action, for human action, in the objectivist philosophy as compared to the powerless drive in Nietzschean philosophy? The basic uh, reason for action in the objectivist philosophy is man's nature, the fact that by his nature he has to create and acquire everything that he needs to sustain or expand his own life, that nothing is given to man on earth, neither material values nor intellectual values, that everything he needs or wants has to be produced and discovered by him, and that is his basic impetus or motivation for action. In Nietzschean philosophy is this mystical undefined concept of will without any definition of what that will is, nor what it is to achieve. It, uh, it is a mystical package deal. Incidentally, you know, this is why existentialists, which are the leading mystical philosophy of today, uh, classify Nietzsche as one of their ancestors. And there's quite a, a, a great deal of ground for uh, adopting him by the existentialists. They are right in doing that. He does belong in their category. They also, you know, advocate commitment to some kind of values for no reason uh, but an arbitrary choice of the individual. Mr. Gotthelf. Nietzsche's concept of the power seeker uh, includes in it the idea which is glorified along with the power seeker being glorified that the power seeker and specifically the power seeker over man is also the independent self-sufficient man. Now in your writings you have said in uh, Howard Rook's speech in the Fountainhead, rulers of men are not egoists. They create nothing. They exist entirely through the persons of others. This being the case, uh, you must see a contradiction in Nietzsche's concept of a power seek of being an independent man. Would you comment further on that, please? Oh, of course. Uh, to begin with, I quite agree with the conclusion you have drawn. In Rourke's speech, I was making the clear distinction between the proper kind of power, if you wish to call it that, that man should seek, which is power over nature. That means knowledge, efficacy, productive ability, uh, which can be called power. But I made very clear that the parasite, the dependent man, is the one who unable to face nature, to rely on his own judgment and create his values himself, tries to seek his survival by means of en enslaving other men. Therefore, the parasite is the most dependent of all men. He has to exist by means of the productive or intellectual activity of others. He has to impose, quote, his will on them in order to survive. Uh, if you analyze the exact essence of what a uh, power uh, luster is, that is a man who seeks power over nature, you would see that from every aspect of his activity, he is necessarily a parasite. He, his, the center of his activity and concern is other men, the maintenance of his power over them, forcing them to do his will. He is not concerned with reality nor with nature. Uh, he is concerned with other men. Uh, he is as much of a parasite as the altruist who sacrifices himself to others. To serve others or to rule them belongs in the same category because in both cases uh, the man who seeks this kind of service or power is making other men the primary concern of his life, whereas morally the primary concern should be the conquest of nature, the acquisition of knowledge and productive activity, which a man has uh, to exercise on his own and not by means of or through the conquest of others. Therefore, the objectivist position would tell you that to seek power over others is one of the worst, most evil forms of parasitism. Far from being the province of a superior man or a hero, it is the province of an inferior man or a coward who dreads the responsibility of standing on his own judgment. 
Mr. Fox. Um, Miss Rand, you have mentioned on other occasions, other occasions, that there are two basic schools of philosophy, the Platonic and Aristotelian. That's right. Uh, since these two are so basic, I was wondering if you could give the uh, metaphysical connection between uh, Nietzsche's philosophy and uh, with Plato and uh, objectivism with Arist Aristotle's philosophy. Well, this distinction applies mainly to uh, the uh, philosopher's view of metaphysics and epistemology, that is, of reality and of man's means for perceiving reality. Plato held that uh, there are in fact two realities and the one which we perceive is only an illusion or an imperfect reflection of a superior kind of reality, the world of forms and ideals as he called them, and that our, what our reason perceives is only this imperfect uh, reality, whereas we perceive the higher reality by means of a feeling or a sudden inspiration uh, which comes to us in effect after we have exhausted the possibilities of reason. A higher mystical illumination is our means of perceiving that higher re real reality. This in very simplified form is the essence of Plato. Well observes that that is what Nietzsche believed, uh, that uh, a reality is only a will, that there are no objective uh, rules, and that what the will his will, man's will, or just this uh, depersonalized will chooses is what constitutes or makes reality. To that extent, you see, he is a pure Platonist, or uh, those, I don't think he would ever call himself that. He is strictly in the Platonic tradition of denying the validity of the reality we perceive, denying the validity of reason as man's tool of knowledge, and ascribing uh, epistemological power to man's feelings, to undefined uh, inspiration or revelation, which perceives some undefined form of higher reality. Now, Aristotle held that there is only one reality, the one which we perceive, and that reason is man's tool for perceiving it. That is exactly what objectivism holds in metaphysics and in epistemology, that there are no other dimensions there is only the one universe, and we have the capacity of perceiving it. The tool by means of which we perceive it is man's mind, and uh, the mind is the faculty which identifies and integrates the material provided by man's senses. Uh, that fundamentally is a strictly Aristotelian approach. Mr. Gotthelf. One quick question before uh, another one on Nietzsche. Uh, would objectivism agree with Aristotle's metaphysics and epistemology in effect down the line? You mean with the total of it? No. Most certainly not, particularly not with Aristotle's metaphysics uh, when uh, he constructed the universe including an immovable mover at, uh, directing all motion, etc. No, we would not agree with his metaphysics but we agree with his basic approach to metaphysics. The fact that only this world exists, and that everything that exists is par a particular, that it is concrete, that abstractions, forms as such, do not exist. Mr. Gotthelf. Question on Nietzsche, as much as I'd love to discuss uh, Aristotle. Um, one of the, the things which led Nietzsche to his power seeker, or Superman theory, uh, was the fact that he observed constant conflicts in the world, conflicts both on the animal level, and there he appealed to Darwin's theory of evolution, conflicts on the physical level, and his examples would be the equivalent of, well, the ocean rushes up against the shore, though I don't know if he ever used that one. And with respect to men, he said it's quite clear that there are constant conflicts of interest among men. Now yet, in Atlas Shrugged, John Galt states, there are no victims and no conflicts of interest among rational men men who do not desire the unearned and do not view one another with a cannibal's lust, men who neither make sacrifices nor accept them. Would you elaborate on that distinction between objectivism and Nietzsche? Well, to begin with, I would say that Nietzsche's position here, it lacks so much about his philosophy, is pure metaphor. I mean, to observe conflict is in nature is a very loose generalization and does not prove anything yet about what is proper for men, nor does it elevate the nature of the conflict 
if you call it that, into a metaphysical principle by which man should be guided. It is strictly poetic license and, and metaphor, which is very dangerous in philosophy. Now, objectivism holds that there are no conflicts of interest among men, for the very reason you have just stated. Uh, add to it what I said earlier. Uh, since man has to maintain his life and achieve all his values by his own effort, since there is no other way for man to acquire values, man does not fight over a given static amount of food or luxuries that exist in nature. He has to create everything that he needs or wants. Precisely for that reason, there can be no conflict of interest among rational men if they all are on the premise that each has to achieve his own values, each has to pursue his own goals, never regarding others as the means to his own ends. In other words, granting the same moral principle to others. If he grants that as he has to achieve his own goals himself, so do every uh, so do all other men. He will then deal with others only as a trader by mutual exchange. If he wants to cooperate, he will deal only with those who wish to cooperate with him, always remembering that each has to pursue his own interest, which cannot be acquired at the expense of others, that others are not there to serve one's own purposes, and one is not there to be a sacrificial animal for others. It is in this sense that you would have perfect cooperation and a non-sacrificial society among men. Mr. Goodman. Ms. Rand, most philosophies have a utopian goal of society, such as Plato's Republic. Is there any objectivist utopian society? Uh, well, I wouldn't like to use that term, because Plato's Republic, incidentally, is the archetype of all totalitarian states. It's the first one on record, and every single one since then has borrowed from Plato one way or the other. If you want to use the term utopia, uh, use loosely, not philosophically, I would suggest that you read Atlas Shrugged, in which I present what you might call a utopia, that is the ideal free society, and I entitle one of my chapters, The Utopia of Greed, deliberately, as a challenge to the whole tradition of pl Platonist uh, utopians who think that the ideal society consists of a regimented, self-sacrificial, altruist herd of men. I show you in Atlas Shrugged what an ideal society of free, independent men would be like. A short question now, Mr. Gotthild. Then would you say that the basic distinction between objectivism and Nietzsche would lie in the role of reason in Nietzsche's outlook on life, his entire philosophy of life, and the role of reason in objectivism's philosophy of life? Uh, yes, I would say that's the crucial distinction. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you, Ms. Ryan. <laughs> Tonight we have been discussing the, faith, the philosophy of Nietzscheism and how it differs from the philosophy of objectivism. With me on the panel tonight were Alan Gotthelt and Jerry Goodman. Ms. Rand, thank you again. This is